love and respect to everybody that's uh, tuned in thanks for being here once again today I thought I'd read this uh, great book right here since we just had the brother a new breed on in the last uh, video talking about his heritage a lot of that heritage coming out of North Carolina and a lot of his ancestors were classified as free people of color when they were American Indians so this book we have here, which is called North Carolina's Free People of Color, 1715-1885, by Warren Eugene Miltier, Jr. It's going to correlate with the research and previous presentations that we've done throughout the years. And we're going to show how people were being, again, misclassified, paper genocide, literally. This really happened. Yeah, American Indians were being labeled free people of color or free Negroes, free mulattoes, things like that. So let's get into the book right away. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Again, North Carolina's free people of color from 1715 to 1885. Warren Eugene Miltier, Jr., Louisiana State University Press, Baton Rouge. We're at the uh, introduction of the book. It says here, in 1902, not long after the publication of a series of now famed works that included The Conjure Woman and other Conjure Tales and The Wife of His Youth and other stories of the color line, Charles Waddell, Chestnut, sat down to pen a lesser known article titled The Free Colored People of North Carolina for Hampton Institute's Southern Workmen. Born to parents who were free persons of color before the Civil War, Chestnut used his intimate knowledge of the population of his study along with other sources to describe the social position and ancestral origins of the free colored people. He wrote that status of these people prior to the Civil War was anomalous but tenable. In describing the origins, Chestnut mentioned mixtures between Negroes, whites, and Indians, all right, all in parentheses so-called whites what whites all right are they really talking about pale skinned people what we picture today a white person supposed to look like now remember the previous videos we've gone over who free whites includes right it also includes the moors and sephardic jews and many of the black europeans north africans etc I just want to remind everybody that, you know, we're reading this great book. We're going to read some great information. And when it comes to the research that he did on his genealogy, he's on point. But when it comes to saying where the origin of all so-called Negroes is, definitely not in Africa. So a lot of the time, even though they know their own history, they still believe the out of Africa theories. You know, so we got to dodge the hijack when we see that when we're reading this today. So continue, it says... He argued that many free people of color, perhaps most of them, were, as we have seen, persons of mixed blood. All right, that's him saying it. Many free people of color, if not most of them, 
were, as we have seen, persons of mixed blood. Again, we got to empty our cup, get rid of our prejudices and stereotypes, and know thyself truly. A careful search through court records, censuses, vital records, church minutes, wills, deeds, newspapers, pension files, and oral histories confirms a picture of life for free people of color remarkably similar to the one described by Chestnut more than a century ago. Continuous as a disorderly American self. For over a generation, historians have depicted 18th and 19th century North Carolina and the rest of the American self as regions dominated by strict racial hierarchies. Their versions of the American self usually include three distinct groups, whites, blacks, and Indians, encapsulated in a social hierarchy that placed whites over all other groups, so-called whites. Remember, they're not always talking about complexion. He's going to get into it. You'll see. Yet the stories of those categorized as free people of color reveal a more disorderly American self. In the colonial and early national periods, North Carolinians and their laws privileged the free over the enslaved, regardless of the racial categories ascribed to them, ascribed, given to them. So it doesn't mean that those tags is who they are. It's just ascribed to them, these racial categories. It didn't matter which one you were classified as because the laws privileged the free over the enslaved, no matter what color. While the degree to which free people of color were the legal superiors of slaves varied across time, this book argues that the legal position of free people of color generally remain closer to that of whites than to that of slaves. Listen, same privileges, so-called whites. They were just like the whites, they were free. Orlando Patterson explained that slaves were the socially dead, agents of their masters with no legally recognized connection to kin or ancestors. Historians have repeatedly shown that slaves in every society develop strong social bonds but none of those relations were legally binding. In contrast, North Carolina law always allowed free people of color, like whites, legal personhood and recognized connection to king. All right? Even during the 1850s and 1860s, when legal limitations were greatest, free people of color retained numerous privileges. Unable to enslaved persons, including the right to own property, access to the courts, the right to keep their wages, and their freedom to leave the state without permission. Now, I just want to remind everybody that let's not forget the freedom suits that the so-called slaves went to. So they had access to the courts too. It wasn't just the free people of color, but also the indentured servants could go argue their case if they think they're being held wrongfully. Free people of color from the colonial period through Reconstruction faced many social, economic, and legal challenges. Prejudice, poverty, and violence were among their various experiences. Yet these obstacles never condemned them to a position close to slave status. The ability to own real and personal property, all right, again, meaning they own slaves too, seek restitution in the courts, and maintain legally recognized bonds to family distinguished even the poorest free person of color from the most fortunate slaves. At any moment, the circumstances of an enslaved person could change forever. With the death of a master, a collection of a debt, or a master's decision to sell an enslaved person away from all things familiar. All right, again, just want to emphasize they're talking like slavery was Kunta Quinta, like, you know, white slave masters and masters and, and African slaves. So you got to break out of that. A lot of this is just indentured servitude. A lot of this is just family owning other family members or just hiring people to work on their farm for a number of years. That was the indenture. And again, we also have the cases where they're grabbing small children, Indians, right? After they ship their whole family to the Caribbean and then putting them under an indenture until their 20s. So when they're talking about people getting freed and masters dying, 
well that's because the contract is over so again it says at any moment the circumstances of an enslaved person could change forever with the death of a master a collection of a debt or a master's decision to sell an enslaved person away from all things familiar many enslaved people never met such changes in circumstance but the possibility that lingered over them made their position distinct in comparison to free persons north carolinians attempts to categorize themselves into races imbued with specific legal and social privileges natural attributes and values always conflicted with their efforts to understand one another in terms of gender class reputation kingship and occupation this internal struggle prevented them from agreeing about the proper social relations between those categorized as white not that they're white listen to the words listen to what he's saying how he's writing it so they had a struggle agreeing about the proper social relations between those categorized as white and those classified as free people of color all in parentheses two words right across time radical political figures emerged who preached that free people of color and slaves were part of a degraded race naturally beneath all whites what whites right what whites all right so i just want to belly flop to this part of the introduction it says here in this part of the introduction understanding racial categories it is important to emphasize up front that free people of color operated in society as a category and not as a term that referred to a fixed group of people okay it was a category pay attention to what he's telling you north carolinians may have imagined otherwise but the evidence in this book demonstrates that free person of color was not necessarily a label an individual carried for life for someone to categorize another individual as a free person of color did not mean that the label became an essential part of that individual's being free person of color was simply a label that signaled an individual was free but not considered white all right he was free but he wasn't one of the whites in a society dominated by an ideology that called for the acceptance of white categorization as normative so they were trying to make the category of making people white so-called white a normative north carolinians labeled as free people of color those assumed to be free people of african descent touch the hijack free people of native ancestry whom the state did not recognize as politically autonomous free persons with heritage in the east indies and a variety of individuals with mixed ancestry they sometimes use free negro free mulatto free musty and free black interchangeably with free person of color but free person of color was the most frequently used term in addition this seems to be the term most widely accepted by those who fell into the category for these reasons of color is the term i use throughout this book all right so before we continue just want to mention again he said those descended from african right those are who are the free people of color he letting you know right on the previous page that it was those of african descent which we already have debunked what africans if anything if anybody's coming from foreign and they're you know of dark complexion it would be the black europeans that are coming over being sent over here indentured servants prisoners of war convicts colonists conquistadors those who are fleeing from religious persecution right check out my previous presentation so we can understand who these people really were so that cancels out that whole african descent if anything if they're talking about foreign people that must be talking about black europeans and then what is the other one who is the free people of color other than african descent is free people of native american indians native american indians again which is interchangeable with free black they're calling american indians free blacks 
free mulattoes, free Negroes. Remember my Freedom Suits video recently that I uploaded? The uh, Indian from uh, this region of, the, uh, of America being sent to Jamaica. She became a Negro slave over there. And when she came back, they were trying to, you know, they had already turned her into a so-called African slave when she was an American Indian and she was able to prove it and win the case. 20th and 21st century historians have used Negro, Black, and African American instead of or in conjunction with person of color, all right? You hear that? That's a big one. So in the 20th and 21st century, which we're living right now, right, in modern times, they stopped saying free person of color. They started using tags like Negro, Black, and African American when it had nothing to do with Africans. Instead of or in conjunction with person of color. Yet to embrace their usage is to accept that racial categories are fixed to specific groups of people with specific collective histories, all right? And that's not true. So you're saying if you go with that, then you're re really accepting that it's, that actually means something, like black means something, like there's actually a black people. The evolution of racial categories, however, is more complex, all right? It's way more deeper than that, than just black and white. All of these terms, especially African American, all right, in parentheses, are loaded with 20th and 21st century connotations of African ancestry, all right? It's based on theories, it's based on out of Africa theory, Darwinism, evolution. That's where they're basing that off. There is no proof. It's just 21st century connotations. They're guessing, it's conjectures. Remember what conjecture means which do not necessarily apply to the subjects of this study or their descendants. Again, big one. Can I get a mic drop? Body bag for the illusion. We're not talking about Africans. It does not apply to the subjects or the people they're talking about in this study or their descendants or their descendants. We ain't talking about African ancestry, though. That's just 21st century hijack, Jesse Jackson, 80s. As this book demonstrates, not all individuals categorized as free people of color, <laughs> okay, had African ancestry. I'm going to repeat that. As this book demonstrates, not all individuals categorized as free people of color had African ancestry ancestry does your own hijacks no dna no we already debunked that too you can't go spit in a tube and think you're gonna find your truck what are you crazy <laughs> i'm quoting henry gates you have to do your genealogy those are scams those dna tests are for entertainment only of course they're gonna tell you you're african that's part of the hijack it's part of their deception. It's part of the lies they've been telling us all our lives. They ain't going to start telling you the truth with a DNA test. They don't promote things to tell you the truth. And they are not collectively the ancestors of people described today as blacks or African Americans. All right. And it's not me making this up. I know you guys are not blind. You guys can read with me. Listen to what he's going to say. He's going to agree with me what I just said. Because these people in this study, he just told you, they don't have no African ancestry. And they are not collectively, all right? I'm going to highlight that for you too. They are not collectively the ancestors of people described today as black or African Americans. So we get a lot of Pan-Africans uh, in the comments, you know. <laughs> You guys haven't done no genealogy. Like we I already know. And you guys are just emotional. I understand what they told you in school and what you believed all your life. But this is not about beliefs. This ain't a religion. You have a religious mind state when you're believing out of Africa theories. When people really do their genealogy, like this author did, he sees. That, that the people that are being called today black or African Americans, they don't have no African ancestry. Large numbers of people who today are the descendants of free people of color 
self-categorized or are classified by others as white and Indian. Okay, making Indians white in Virginia. Remember my my past presentations on that. And when we're talking about status and not complexion, and when Negro means bondage or indentured, and white means free or a property owner, then it's a whole different game here. Again, a lot of free people of color, they self-categorize themselves or by others as white and Indian. The story of free people of color may be one of the best examples of racial categories being made and remade in American history, being made and remade again and again. You keep changing, right? You keep changing. You go from Indian, colored, Negro, black, African American, and so on and so on. Additionally, some older descendants of free people of color have explained to me that their ancestors understood black, right? So called black, black to be a derogatory term. Why are you calling yourself black? Your ancestors didn't call themselves black, derogatory term for many of them, and not one. They embrace as self descriptor. They didn't call themselves so called black. What you mean black? These assertions are confirmed by the contrasting use of terminology between 19th century radical pro slavery propagandists who frequently use the term black. All right? Pro slavery propagandists. What slavery? This is a propaganda, and they started calling you and terming you black. Literally, to make you something that doesn't even exist. They blanked you out. You're black. All right? In their writings. And other North Carolinians who commonly use of color. I have found evidence that the category free people of color included individuals without African ancestry. He found much evidence. When you actually research, this is what you actually find. But then you also find something else. And that's a European part for a lot of people. And it wasn't whites. That's the thing. It wasn't pale skinned people. That's what we thought before. But definitely, as he says here, without African ancestry. All right? Not Africans. We're not talking about Africans. And everybody didn't come out of Africa. These are not my theories. Not my ideas. This is genealogy, primary sources, anthropology, do the research. So let me read that back because I didn't finish the sentence. All right. It says, I have found evidence that the category free people of color included individuals without African ancestry, most notably native peoples who American Indians, what? They're being called what? Free people of color, American Indians. Scholars of Native American history have uncovered numerous examples of Native people being categorized as black. Pull up, all right? Pay attention. Scholars, people who actually do research, real scholars, not people who do vlogs on YouTube and just talk all day. Scholars of Native American history or American Indian or indigenous history of America, the scholars of indigenous history of America have uncovered numerous examples of American Indians being categorized as black, so-called black, colored, or mulatto. Don't talk to me about what you think you know. Show me the sources. Prove to me they're African without DNA tests, fake DNA tests. That's all you got in a movie called Roots. That's all you got. Ruth Wallace Herndon and Ella Wilcox Sikatu argued that such labeling of native people was a form of documentary genocide. Okay? We're just talking about paper genocide. Paper genocide. Yeah, that's real. And it's still going on today. You keep calling yourself so-called black. Documentary genocide. So genocide in many levels and many ways. Physically and in paper. I agree that such labels obscure ancestral distinctions. I also think and show, however, that racial categories have never truly acted as accurate indicators of ancestry. Whites in 19th century North Carolina were quite 
aware that they had branded native people as colored. They knew what they were doing. Listen to what he's telling you. And even after such labeling retained memory, or at least they believed that certain free people of color were natives people. With this understanding, I urge scholars, I urge you, if you're listening, if you're a true scholar, to reimagine the genesis of racial categorization for American Indians in the United States as in other parts of the Americas. All native people did not fall into the Indian category. Some native people lived under the designation colored, colored experience the legal limitations associated with such a designation you hear that that status because they were being labeled colored now now their status had changed they had legal limitations associated with such a designation lived in communities in which racial categorization was imposed and not self-ascribed and described themselves as colored people while still retaining memories of their indigenous heritage. Man, this is deep right here. What did grandma tell you always? What did the grandparents and ancestors always tell you, man? She said, I'm this and I'm that. I ain't African. This is deep, man. It, it go, it, it's sad, man, to me. It's sad, but it's beautiful at the same time. It's beautiful how we find books like this explaining everything we've been learning. And proven your grandmother right. And they held on to these memories. This is deep. You can't forget. Jack D. Forbes, important, but often neglected. And that's the book Africans and Native Americans, which we have read in my past videos. Showed that categorization of a diversity of people, including so-called Africans, East Indians, and Native peoples as black, colored, and a host of other ambiguous colored terms dates to at least the 16th century. We're talking about 1500s. 1500s. Even before this point, Europeans used color to describe a diversity of people. Forbes demonstrated that racial categories had their earliest origins in attempts to describe and order human beings. I find that Negro, colored, and other terms did the same work in 18th and 19th century North Carolina. North Carolinians sought to apply racial categories as descriptors of difference and as tools to organize society. In North Carolina, as in most of the European colonized world, Officials use racial categories in their attempts to define status, all right? Again, in their attempts to define status, status of people, it was status, free white status, white status, Negro status, status. Today's racial and ethnic language blurs distinctions among racial categorizations, ancestry, and culture while attempting to ignore the historical baggage of legalized hierarchy making. We discuss whites, European Americans, and Caucasians as one people, blacks or African Americans as another, and we refer to other racialized people in a similar fashion. Just want to remind everybody, <laughs> again, I'm going to keep going over it because when you repeat things, you know, like just like in school, they make you repeat this until you take the test to see if you remember. What does free whites mean? Look what it says in the bottom about Caucasians. Free white does not mean Caucasian race, Aryan race, or Indo-European races. Nor the mixed Indo-European, Dravidian, Semitic, or Mongolian peoples who inhabit Persia. And right above it, free whites again includes Moorish inhabitants of Spain and Portugal. Again, continuing, this book shows, however, that not all people of African descent are black or African American. Today, all white people are not solely of European ancestry. Hello. And not all Americans, fight Allah, <laughs> fight Allah, with indigenous heritage are not Indians. 
Historians of the United States have rarely taken this reality into serious consideration. That's why people are so emotional with this kind of information. But the story of free people of color shows why we should. All right. Why we should. All right. So now we go to chapter one of this book. It says here, making race, remembering freedom, constructing racialized liberty. As George and Joseph Bennett prepared to leave Gates County, North Carolina, to cross into neighboring Virginia, the two young men met with local justices of the peace to obtain freedom papers. All right, so this first example here, the story, we've actually gone over it in a previous video that I've done. If you remember the video I did on the Chowan people of North Carolina, we know that the Bennett family, the Sephardic Jews who came, because Bennett is a Sephardic Jews, it goes back to Baruch Bennett. They mixed with the Chowan people and other uh, natives people in North Carolina. So these two young men met with local justices of the peace to obtain freedom papers, George and Joseph Bennett. These documents would prove their liberty in the event their free status ever came into question. The justices provided each man with a document dated May 14th, 1794, that explained that he was freeborn and the son of an Indian. All right. They're talking about the maternal line, right? The maternal line, an Indian and a free woman. So their mom was an American indigenous woman. In case someone needed to verify that the papers pertained to the man who possessed them, each freedom document gave a physical description of the holder. George's free papers described him as about 25 years of age, about 5 feet 7 inches high with a scar over his left eye, while Joseph's past stated he was about 24 years of age, about 5 feet 9 inches high with a scar over his right eye. After receiving the free papers, the Bennets made their way to Norfolk County, Virginia. What happened to Joseph is unclear, but George eventually left Virginia. He returned to Gates County to reside in the community known by locals as Indian Town. There, George lived among other descendants of the indigenous Showan people. Okay, so again, make sure to check out my video for the full length uh, documentary on this. When George and Joseph were children, the county clerk had recognized their indigenous heritage and registered them as Indian. All right. Remember, these are free people of color, so-called black people in the court's minute book. The clerk also described them as Indian in the 1790s when they participated in the sale of the last piece of the Chowan reservation. So we go over how they sold this land too. And they did it without the authorization of all the community, all the Chowan indigenous people. Remember, these are Bennett's. The mom is Indian. Where's the dad coming from? And he wasn't a white person. Yet when the census enumerator came through the Indian town neighborhood in 1810, he classified George Bennett, along with the other Chowan descendants, as free colored persons. All right, paper genocide. The story of George and Joseph Bennett reveals that a person became a free person of color, not through something purely biological, but through an intellectually complex process of categorization. Therefore, George Bennett could be an Indian in one context and free colored in another. Other incidents described in this chapter tell a similar story. Free persons of color was a social political construct that denotes free status and categorization as not white. All right. Yet this construct only functioned because North Carolinians supposed that through a series of determinations, a person could be categorized as white, Indian, Negro, mulatto, musty, or of color. This is what sociologist Sarah Danes and Orville Lee aptly describe as believe in race, the belief in race beliefs. People in early North Carolina had to decide individuals' racial 
categorizations through processes of evaluation. Even when they believed racial categories corresponded to biology, they used a series of schema such as skin color, hair textures, behavior, reputation, and features of one's ancestors to construct racial categories and organize individuals within their society into those categories, all right? So it's almost like what we do today. We look at somebody who's like, oh, he looked this and he looks like that. Or he looked like a Mongol. Or he looked Indian. Or he looked like a white man. Or he looked like a black European. Or he looked like he African. Or he looked like he's from Asia. Their evaluations and decisions produce a situation in which people with a spectrum of physical features and various family histories fell into the same category. So, for example, if there's somebody from Europe that might have some like similar look to an American Indian, hey, they got classified as the same thing, being the same people. Whether they were actually related or of the same bloodline or not. The census taker may have categorized George Bennett as colored person because of his physical appearance. Oh, why? so why would he call him colored? So obviously, George Bennett was a dark complexion man right so they were just basing it on his physical appearance or based on his understanding that Bennett had non-European ancestry or in the vernacular of the early 19th century Negro or Indian blood so I want to so make sure to dodge the hijack right there when she said non-European remember the author is going with the whole out of Africa theories and that Europeans are all white even though he knows his people are being classified people of color and he can prove that they were Indian he can't prove the African part and he can't prove that all Europeans are white so-called white <laughs> a pale skin you know pale skin before the end of the Civil War freedom was something that had to be proven and public memory through either individual understandings or documentation was the only way people could establish their freedom. Community members recognized a person as free because they recognized aspects of that person's past that signaled liberty. As in the case of the Bennets and many others, they were free because their neighbors recalled that their mother was free, a standard designated within the law. Neighbors' memories of their liberation from enslavement supported others' freedom. North Carolinians also use documents to reinforce public memory of freedom, such as making a race. In the 18th and 19th centuries, North Carolinians spoke of and understood racial categorization or a person's so-called race through ancestry. They believed that individuals were free persons of color because of their lineage or blood. In reality, however, they actually had to rely on schemas to categorize people as white, Indian, colored, Negro, mulatto, or musty. Sociologists have defined schemas as mental structures in which knowledge is represented. Examples of schemas used to determine racial categorization included skin color, hair texture, behavior, reputation, and memories about an individual's ancestry. North Carolinians believe that through their sight, they believed, again, listen to what they're saying, they believed that through their sight and memory, they could successfully categorize a person as white or not white. They believed they were using their eye. They, they were just going off the physical. They agreed that dark skin made someone colored, while fair skin made someone white. So if you were fair skin enough, oh yeah, he's white. If he was dark skin enough, uh, he's colored. This is the aspect of so-called race that is cultural. Yet because schemas such as dark skin and fair skin are mental representations and not actual things in the world, all right, that's not real. It's all in your head. Interpretation based on a physical look. But again... These are not actual things in the world. North Carolinians regularly failed to agree 
on the border between dark skin and fair skin and therefore sometimes struggle to classify people inconsistently categorized people or disagreed about individuals categorizations legal experts and common people all attempted to define free persons of color by discussing ancestry in their 1857 opinion for the case state versus shavers all right who's the shavers the shavers most of the shavers would be saponi catabas suing people members of the north carolina supreme court declared free persons of color may be then for all we can see persons colored by indian blood or persons descended from negro ancestors beyond the fourth degree all right so they didn't say africans they say negroes what negroes and again these are all tags what are they calling so-called negro but they're letting you know that it also included indian blood people believe that ancestry could be connected to racial categorization largely because of the schemas they associated with certain types of ancestry aligned with the assumed ancestry or race of an individual north carolinians could be certain that sam balaam was a person of color because his skin was very black even tom mitchell's yellow complexion unambiguously fell within their definition of a person of color yellow complexion right we've seen runaway ads listing the person uh, or, you know calling him a negro as bright yellow <laughs> bright yellow complexion thomas bowser's bushy head of hair along with his very dark complexion supported his categorization as a colored person All right now remember we've gone over descriptions of europeans from the american revolutionary war being described with the same exact features bushy head and very dark complexion we've also got the same from the jacobites who are being transported over here in 1745 make sure to go back to the previous presentations if you're new if, if you're having a hard time you know just accepting this truth right here we've been here five years over 300 presentations all we show is sources primary scholarly uh, research genealogy things you cannot dispute these are facts historic facts you can verify so i'm glad they're showing these examples because you know just because people have these features oh yeah that's a negro that's a colored man from there they start adding the whole african hijack it could be american indians it could be black europeans that's the truth so his bushy head and his very dark complexion right thomas bowser supported his categorization as a colored person J.M. Harris, however, had to know something about William Revel's family background in order to recognize him as a person of color because Revel's nearly white complexion allowed him to pass as a white boy, potentially. A stranger might have considered Revel's to be white, but the public memory shared among those who knew him best allowed them to classify him as colored. Everybody knew who his peoples were even though he was very light-skinned, right? A very fair. Racial categorization was ultimately a product constructed in the minds of people, all right? Racial categorization was ultimately a product constructed in the minds of people who use race as a way to frame their world. These people believe that nature and not their minds divided the human species into whites, Negroes, mulattoes, Indians, musties, and colored people. Yet the failure of individuals to classify the people around them consistently exposes the cognitive origins of racial categories, all right? And that's why there were so many disputes and problems and freedom suits, because it's not clear, because it's not real. You can't go off just a physical look, especially when they lie to us about who people are in history. Various North Carolina courts records document the inconsistent use of racial categories. In 1771, the Edenton District Court clerk referred to Philip Chavis of Anson County as a Negro, mulatto, and musty within the same set of documents for a single civil case. All right, Chavis, all right, Chavis family. Again, a lot of them are from the Suen uh, people, Saponi, Catawba. 
and they'll let you know themselves. In another example from 1795, a clerk simply referred to a man from Bertie County called John as a mulatto or Indian. Is he is mulatto or Indian? You know, one or one, either or. You know, same thing. <laughs> In a statement written by his attorney, this same John is labeled a free man of color. In theory, Negroes, mulattoes, musties, and Indians were supposed to be different types of people, right? They're supposed to be different people, right? But yet these same people are being classified as Negroes, as free uh, people of color, as mulattoes, as Indians, and in different records. Even 18th and 19th century dictionaries provided the public with specific definitions of these racial terms. These examples, however, show that lines between categories in, in practice were poorly defined and ambiguous. Nowhere were the issues of inconsistent classification and construction of racial categories more problematic than in the case of North Carolina's indigenous people. All right? All right? <laughs> Let me repeat that. We're going to highlight it too. Nowhere were the issues of inconsistent classification, all right, paper genocide, and the construction of racial categories more problematic than in the case of North Carolina's indigenous people. And who, so who are these people that went through all this misclassification? Yeah, you've never heard of their tribes. By the early 19th century, most of the North Carolina's indigenous population, east of the Appalachians, became subject to shifting categorization, which has led some scholars and lay people alike to believe that native populations of the region had disappeared. They said you disappeared and you went extinct, yet Anu was with us just the other day. He's still here. What you mean disappeared? They still here. These North Carolina tribes are still here. They're just being called so-called Negroes today or whites, African Americans, so-called blacks. So that's the hijack. They ain't disappeared. They haven't disappeared. In reality, they were simply recategorized from Indians to colored persons, mulattoes or Negroes. Okay. In reality, that's what really happened. They're not Africans. From the colonial period into the early national era, whites began a slow process of reclassifying natives people from Indians into ambiguous others thereby eliminating the legal distinctions between a diversity of native peoples and other people classified as persons of color. From their arrival in the Americas, colonists, all right, again, who's these colonists? Stop thinking pale skin people. Bound natives people, all right? What? Enslaved or bound them, put them in an indenture. Who? Black European colonists, too. It wasn't all pale skin people. I really strongly believe it was more black Europeans. So colonists bound natives people to certain areas of land just as they associated their neighbors in Europe to certain territories. The earliest maps of North Carolina show territorial boundaries for each native nation that inhabited a particular area. From this point on, the colonists would associate certain land masses with particular natives people, all right? That's a major one right there. That's true. You know, Indians, even though they had a main area, they didn't just stay there. They were going all over the place. They were doing trade everywhere. They didn't have boundaries. You know, like Anu was saying, his people originated in Ohio. The Sioux people really had, they still had connections with Ohio, from Ohio to North Carolina, and all the way to the plains and, and to the south and everywhere else. Trade was going on. They weren't confined to a specific area. That was the Europeans who started doing that, saying, hey, you guys, this is your area. Stay right there. From this point on, the colonists would associate certain land masses with particular native people. Colonization itself, however, threatened to destroy the colonizer's system of organizing native people. Through the 17th and 18th century, the colonizers appropriated thousands of acres of native land for their own use and thus pushed native people off the exact lands that these colonists had used to define distinct native populations so eventually they even took those lands we know that who and it wasn't just white people come on pale skin people all skin folk ain't kin folk and that's okay it's just part of history and it's in your genealogy both sides it's okay 
Natives people no longer fit definition of Indian, created during the earliest days of colonization. As native peoples, life ways changed from those observed by the earliest colonists, and the lands once controlled by natives people were transferred to the hands of non-natives or non-Indians. In the eyes of some non-natives, these native people were no longer Indians, but simply colored people. Continuing. The historical record provides a few examples of the reclassification of American Indians from Indian to others. The Shoans and Matamuskits went through processes that convinced local officials to reclassify them. Again, make sure to catch the video I did on that so you guys can see uh, the sources and the history. These processes generally included the dissolution of their reservations in eastern North Carolina and changes in their life ways, including the incorporation of European colonial methods of farming into traditional agricultural practices. Many other natives people in North Carolina likely went through similar processes during the colonial period, but have stories that are poorly documented compared to those of the Chowans and Matamuskits. All right. So that's a good point he just brought up. We do find records of this happening to the Chowan people and, and the other tribes, but not all the tribes were fortunate enough to have, you know, this publicly known or the records to prove it. Or as it says here, very poorly documented compared to the Chowans or the Matamuskets. In Gates County, Chowans appeared in court minutes and deeds as Indians. During the 1780s, for example, James Benjamin Patience Sarah Nancy, Elizabeth, Darks, and Christian Robbins appear as Indians. In 1782, deed by the first census in 1790, however, these Indians had become free others and later free colored persons. Ten years later, the census enumerator classified James, Sarah, and Darkies Robbins as heads of households of other free persons. In contrast to white persons, record keepers categorized the descendants of the Matamuskets who had intermarried with both people of European and people of African descent. So Dr. The Hijack, they want you to think white and black, right? That each one of these is the white, one of these is the black. Dr. The Hijack, what Africans? And when you talk about Europeans, how you know these are not so-called black folks too? You don't. And a lot of them were. So that's the point. In 19th century records as mulattoes and free persons of color. By understanding racial categories as products of cognitive processes, we can begin to recognize the diverse backgrounds and stories encompassed within these categories. Free persons of color were not a group per se, but a complicated mixture of people connected by their neighbors and often their own perceptions of the world. North Carolinians imagined that those they categorized as free people of color shared common traits that distinguished them from those people classified as white. Yet in their appearances and family backgrounds, they were as diverse, as diverse as any other imagined community in what in their appearances and family. The example of the Bennetts from Gates County at the beginning of this chapter was just one instance of neighbors supporting freedom claims by establishing individuals' connection to free Indian foremother. In 1804, county clerk affirmed that Price Longtom and Jordan Longtom were free persons by stating that their mother Mary Polly Longtom was an Indian woman because freedom was a function of memory and not something observable Occasionally, some people who were legally free had their liberty challenged by those who attempted to hold them in bondage. Memories of descent from Indian foremothers became important to the cases of some Carolinians who believed they were illegally held in slavery. In 1785, Jenny Ash, a mulatto woman, petitioned the justices of the Bertie County Court for her freedom and that of her children. Jenny asserted that she was the daughter of Nanny Ash, an Indian and freeborn, and that James Gardner was holding both herself and her children in slavery under the threat of sending them out of the state. All right, you hear that? So that was really wrong what's going on. 
And they were like, no, man, we, we Indians. We free. We should be free. Although examples exist, statements connecting the lineages of free people of color to Indian foremothers are rare. By the 19th century, North Carolinians living east of Cherokee County had largely given up trying to draw a distinction between people they believed to be indigenous and other people that they classified as persons of color. Consequently, many declarations of freedom in which the foremothers were native women likely referred to them as people of color and not specifically Indian. Continue a little further in the book, it says here, the role of cognitive processes and memory in the categorization of individuals as free people of color is largely missing from the historical literature. Scholars have approached the topic of free people of color as an examination of a subset of a defined African American, right in parentheses, black in parentheses, or Negro in parentheses, group without considering how the category was imagined or applied. Mentions of people of color, mulattoes, Negroes, musties, and Indians throughout the rest of this book should be read as reflections of how particular North Carolinians understood their world in the 18th and 19th centuries. All right, so he's telling you, you got to dodge the hijack sometimes when you see these words, like we've been trying to tell you. Many of the people whose neighbors classified them as people of color may have self-categorized differently. You, you understand that? So even though the neighbors say, well, I think he's white or I think he's a black, you know, the people themselves didn't call themselves none of that. They didn't agree to it. So again, many of the people whose neighbors classified them as people of color may have self-categorized differently. Furthermore, this chapter demonstrates that North Carolinians often could not agree how to categorize one another. Individuals found applying racial categories difficult and had to use multiple terms from their racial lexicon to describe a single person. All right. So that's where we're going to end it here. Most likely going to read more of this uh, book, other chapters. This is the end of chapter one and a little bit of the introduction. Just wanted to get our feet wet with this book great book and because we also went live the other day with a brother who comes from this same lineage and heritage uh indians from north carolina and virginia this was happening you know there too as well and again many of these people became reclassified paper genocide not just to negro but a lot of them indian tribes different ones from the algonquin tribes to the Siouan tribes iroquois speaking tribes they were being classified as Cherokee. Let's not forget that, too, a lot of them. So I hope you enjoyed this information. Just wanted to do a real quick video. <laughs> I guess to some is quick, to some is lo as long. <laughs> Depends on how you see it. Thought it was really good information, just to clarify certain things, and to hear from somebody else other than me. We got a lot more books coming. I got a lot of books that I've found recently. We're going to definitely go into them. Videos are going to keep coming. The learning never stops. Thanks for tuning in. A wah bless.